Okay. Good morning, everybody. Any questions or announcements before we start? Uh, I have a question really fast just yeah. about the lab. Um, yeah. I just wanted to know uh, which numbers uh, you took off again, just to confirm for uh, um, lab, lab three. three. Yes. Yeah, it was the last part of question two. And then on the um, fourth one, or on the third question, it depends on what your model selection results are. If you have a single covariate in your top model, then you can do the last part on question three. If you have more than one covariate, then it will be um, beyond the scope of this course. It would be plotting in three dimensions. All right, thanks. Yep. Um, I also had a quick question about lab yeah. three. Yes. When you ask for high, where are my words today? Hypothesis about the models. Uh -huh. Do you just want us to predict what you we think the model will look like? This is more about. I mean, yes, but let me be a little specific about that. This is more about the biology of the system. Like, why do you think that would happen? Um, so we're putting on the biologist hat and taking off the analyst hat and saying. Well, why do we think that home range size would be related to this? Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yep. Okay, so uh, I have an update about exam, t exam one. Exam one is going to be, I'll distribute it October 5th, two weeks from today. It'll be a take home exam and you'll have until Friday to complete it. You'll be working independently on this. What time on Friday, Perry? Friday before uh, midnight. And we'll get all of your labs to you. Let's see. So, one, two, lab four, lab five starts Wednesday. Five. You'll have all your labs uh, through lab five graded. Let's, um, yeah, but that'll, those will be the dates and we'll get, I'll get back to you on lab, lab five returns because lab five will be, let's see, we start lab five on the 30th. I had another question about lab three. Yes, go ahead. Do you, um, did you define what the vegetation types were in that paper or should we not use those as our uh, very- Those, yeah, those are defined as the vegetation types. If I remember, veg type one was like a hardwood forest. Veg okay. type two was clear cut, three and was are those, cold. Okay, and are those in the article? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Harry, I don't think that lab five will be due for the Monday lab until the fifth. Because lab three yeah. is due for me day to day. Yeah, I was I was just looking that I want to work going to work that out too and, and think about grading and everything. We might put an earlier date due date on lab five. Or we might not include it on the exam. I think we'll have everything we need. Lab four is, lab four has already been done. Lab five will be impo important for the exam. Yeah. Okay. So there might be a slightly different change in the routine for due dates on lab five. 
But if I post the video on, let me look at the calendar. If I post the video on the 30th, no, it would be, if I post the video on the 23rd, you'll have over a week. You'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 at least nine days to get it done. Okay. Lab four video is posted. I think it's processing right now. It might be done. Any other questions before we begin? All right, we're going to talk about our second lecture on binomial regression. And mainly this is how do we interpret the parameters and how do we, how do we use our output for making inference? So this is closely tied to what, what we will be talking about in lab four or what we've already talked about in lab four. So this lecture works nicely with that lab and we get some hands-on practice in lab doing what we're talking about today. All right, so Bernoulli regression or binomial regression is a specific type of generalized linear model. Uh, again, we're using generalized linear model because our normal linear regression model, uh, the data types don't match up with normal regression. So in normal regression, our data, our response variable y is between negative infinity and infinity. Those are the possible values it could take. But with Bernoulli regression, our response data are zeros and ones. Now, it's important to make a distinction between our response data and our covariate data here, because our covariate data, our x's, uh, could be zeros and ones in normal regression. We, we saw that before. Uh, if we had uh, two different categories that we, that we thought may predict our outcome. Um, but now we're talking about the actual response data. And we talked about uh, zeros and ones and how often they can be used in wildlife ecology. So this is one of the most popular types of models that are used in, in wildlife ecology, these Bernoulli regression models. So in terms of learning outcomes for this lecture, there's quite a few of them. Um, and here's what they are. So you'll need to be able to know how to write a general and a fitted model statement for Bernoulli regression. So we've done this a lot for normal regression and how we modify that to do this for Bernoulli regression. We want to know how to implement Bernoulli and binomial regression in R. It's just one letter difference. Well, the main function is one letter difference than how we did it in li with linear models. We use G the GLM function instead of the LM function. Uh, we want to know how to interpret our parameters, beta zero and beta one in Bernoulli regression. And this is closely tied to uh, number four on this list, which is if you use this summary command after fitting the GLM model, how do you take beta zero and beta one and calculate the probability of success using the inverse logit function when covariate values are specified? Um, let's see, this is from last lecture. change this in my script right now. All right, so we only have four. Now let's start off with an example. Uh, we have ma uh, two pictures of mallards here, a male and a female. And there's a hypothesis out there. It's pretty well-established hypothesis. There's a lot of evidence to support it, that breeding is an expensive feat to do for female uh, birds. It takes a lot of energy and resources. They have to incubate nests. 
Uh, they have to sit there. It's one of the reasons they're more camouflaged than males. But one of the costs of breeding is lower survival rates. So if a female uh, breeds in a given year, there's a trade-off that they do. And the trade-off is I want to increase my reproductive output at the cost of lower survival rate. So the hypothesis for that question is um, female, female mallards have lower breeding survival than males. So in that specific time of year. So how would we examine that hypothesis? We talked about this a little bit last lecture. Uh, we might go out and we might mark some individual birds by putting bands on them. And we, we could capture some before the breeding season, release them, and then try and recite them after the breeding season. And if we recite them, our data is a one. And if we don't recite them, our data is a zero. Now, assuming we know where we live, where they live for now, and, and they, uh, we know where to go and find them, and if they're alive, we'll find them, then it's the response data are either a zero or one. They're either going to be alive and we see them, uh, or they'll die. We're right now, for the time being, putting off the possibility that they stayed alive, but we didn't see them. And we're going to add more complexity to our models later to address that very realistic scenario. But right now, just to develop our Bernoulli regression, they either survived or they didn't. And if they survived, we saw them. So the two data types we can get are a one and a zero. Those are our response data, our Ys. Um, OK. So let's talk about writing out a general model statement for Bernoulli regression. Let me pull up the whiteboard here. And I made a little bit of modification. My Apple Pencil still isn't here. But I can use my finger. I messed with this over the weekend. Let's see. All right, let me share my screen. All right, we'll start off with uh, how we always start off with our response data, our zeros and ones. We're going to say those are yi's. Those are a random variable, and they come from a Bernoulli distribution. With probability of success mu. And then we want to relate our probability of success of mu to some covariates, just like we did with normal linear regression. But remember, these values here have to be between 0 and 1. So we need a function that converts our beta 0 plus beta 1 x to values between 0 and 1. And that function that we're going to use in this class is called the logit function. So the logit of mu equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x times i. And our question is about males and females right now. So x i is going to equal 1 for females and 0 for males. So this statement right here is our general model statement for Bernoulli regression for the case of one covariate. And that covariate is whether it's male or female. What we'll talk about in lab four is um, converting mu i, converting this function so that it gives us values between 0 and 1. And the way we do that is called the inverse logit.
All right, so the question is, how do we estimate our parameters beta 0 and beta 1? Let me say a couple more things about this model compared to the normal linear regression model, and we'll touch about this later too. But notice we don't have a sigma squared. Compared to normal regression, we actually have one less parameter than normal regression. We don't have to estimate sigma squared. In normal regression, sigma squared represents the variance. To calculate the variance for, uh, for our data yi, we do something different. We still only estimate one parameter, mu, or actually our betas, and that gives us mu. But once we have those parameters, we can calculate what the variance is by doing mu i times 1 minus mu i. And that gives us the variance of y. So how much spread we see about around y. Now, we spend a lot of time talking about residuals in normal regression. And let's think about residuals in this case. When we were talking about um, simple linear regression, we had our x values our y values, and we had some data. And then when we had these data, we could plug them into R and we could get our slope and our intercept of our fitted line. And this fitted line was mu, and that equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x. And then the residuals were the distance from the data to the line. Now, this is kind of a strange co concept when we're talking about uh, Bernoulli regression. Because in Bernoulli regression, if we do the same type of thing, so this is normal regression, and this is Bernoulli, we still have x values that we can consider. But what are our y values? All right, let me call on someone here. So, Samir, what do you think? What are our Y values here? Um, I have no idea. Okay. Our, all right. So let's go back to our data, our example. Wait, is it um, if they're male or female? Those are our x values, male or female, for the, for the Mallard example. So we talked about our y values right away when we were collecting our data. Let's, um, let's expand. Let's look a little more in detail in this example. Stephen is saying uh, breeding survival in the chat. Okay, that's right, Stephen. Yep. So whether they survived or not. So let's let's write this out in Excel and walk through the data collection process. All right. So we 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 went out and we captured twenty birds, twenty mallards.
Now, we followed those 20 birds through the breeding season, and if they were alive at the end of the breeding season, they get a one, and if they were dead, they get a zero. So let's just insert that data here. These are, these are the, the fates of the animals. All ones and zeros. These are the Y values. These are whether or not they survive. We could um, also collect information if we capture them and put bands on them. We could also collect information on their wing length. So let's insert some data here. This is hypothetical data. If I was using R, I would just do something like R norm to generate these. And then we also collect information on whether they're male or females. One was female. And zero was male. Okay, so these are our data shown here. Make this a little bigger. If I can. There we go. And we're going to use these data to try and fit our Bernoulli regression model. Basically, what we're going to try and do is estimate the beta parameters, beta 0, beta 1. All right. Whether or not they survive the breeding period, 1 is yes, 0 is no. Those are the Ys. So let me just put in parentheses here Y. Wing length, this is a covariate. Maybe bigger birds have better survival rates. So we can call this X1. And then what we're really interested with our hypothesis was whether or not females are negative, their survival is negatively affected by breeding. So in all these birds, the females bred uh, and the males have only a minor contribution to that. Okay, so then now let's go back to our, our plot here. All right. So we're back in our Bernoulli regression model. So now our Ys are zeros and ones, and our Xs, we have two Xs. We have uh, wing length and also male or female. Let's look at wing length. So let's say X1 equals wing length. Now this plot's gonna look very different than the normal regression plot. So let's say our survived birds, are up here. This is y equals 1, and here's y equals 0. How many actually survived? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right. And then there were seven birds that died. All right, so this is what a plot of the data look like. And after we do that inverse logit function, our mu is not a straight line, it's a nonlinear line, and it looks like an S, well, kind of an S, sigmoidal shape. Looks something like this. Because it takes that straight line between negative infinity and infinity and tries to bend it and squeeze it between zero and one. So this is our mu function. And right here, this is our mu. And this equals the inverse logit of beta zero 
plus beta 1 x1. So our residuals look a lot different than they did before. We could still think about the distance between the line and the points. That's one way to do it. But a lot of the a lot of the time it'll be very close to zero when it's down in this area and up in that area. All right. So now let's go back to actually fitting our betas. We're still trying to fit the betas. That's the main objective of Bernoulli regression, of, of generalized linear regression. Any questions about that? Okay, so how do we estimate the parameters beta zero and beta one? And as I mentioned, there's no sigma squared to estimate with the Bernoulli distribution. Instead, the variance is a function of the mean, and that's mu times one minus mu. Well, the way we do it is use the GLM function in R. So we use the LM function in uh, normal regression. Now we're using the GLM function for Bernoulli regression. We're also going to use GLM for Poisson regression, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. And the code is very similar. I'm going to make this bigger. If we have some data, here's just a subset of that data. We have our ones and zeros. Those are our y's, whether it's an animal survived. In general, we're talking about survival right now, but in general, a one means a success and a zero means a failure. So this is the same type of thing we could do with coin flips. You could fit this, you could collect some data of your own by flipping a coin a hundred times, marking every time you get a heads with a one, every time you get a tails with a zero, and then try and estimate what beta zero, what beta zero is. All right, so we said what our y's are. Our y equal one zero one zero one zero. If this were our mallards, the ones would be the ones that survived, and zeros would be the ones that died. And then our x, we're gonna we're gonna look at wing length here. Eventually, we'll look at um, the sex of the bird too. But just for an example here, let's look at wing length. Here's the wing lengths of these six birds, and the way we fit it is we say GLM y tilde x, and now we have to say family equals binomial. And we're going to say link equals logit. You can actually leave this part off, this link equals logit, if you're doing a logit function, because this is the default in R. And then you're going to get some output. So why don't I just go ahead and run these commands in R. And we can take a look at the output. So I'm just going to copy these over from the slides. I'll make this a little bigger. Survive wing length. And now we do GLM Y tilde X. I'll just say family equals binomial. I'll delete this for now because it's it's a little re redundant. And it gives us some output. We can call this model one. And then do summary of model one. Okay, here's our estimate for beta zero for the intercept. Here's our estimate for beta one. Very similar to what we did in simple linear regression. All right, let's move on.
we have the output shown here, intercept equals beta zero and this X equals beta one. All right, now going back to our, our, our general model statement, uh, if we want to take our values from our R output and, and write our fitted model statement, we plug in the values it gave us for beta zero and beta one into our model statement. And that's the difference between general model statement and fitted model statement. So now we have this model here for our Mallard data. We haven't quite looked at the hypothesis of males versus females. We'll do that next as a second example. Now you can write this out two ways. You can write out the inverse logit on the, on the right-hand side of the equation or the logit on the left-hand side of the equation. And writing it out means the same thing. You could do either way. Uh, and there's reasons we go back and forth. But if you go back to algebra, I'll show you why you can do this. algebra and calculus, if you have uh, y equals 2 times x, you can get x by itself by multiplying both sides by 1 half. So 1 half y equals x. Now we get x by itself. The way we write that more generally is we could say if y equals 2x, uh, x by itself is going to be the inverse of 2. And the inverse of 2 is 1 half. So 2 over 1 equals 2. If we take the inverse of that, it's 1 over 2. All right, very simple example. Now, if we make this a little more complicated, and say the logit of mu equals beta zero plus beta one x, then we can say, well, let's take the inverse of the logit function to both sides of this equation, we'll get mu by itself. So if we do the logit inverse of the logit of mu, that's going to equal the logit inverse of beta 0 plus beta 1x. And then this, these two functions here cancel. It's like saying 2 over 1 times 1 over 2 equals 1. So then we get just mu by itself. And that's going to equal the logit inverse of beta 0 plus beta 1x. So that's why we can write it both ways. Writing the top line here is equivalent to writing this. It's just we've, we've, uh, we're, we've decided we've changed which side of the equation is by itself. Here we have mu by itself, and here we have beta zero plus beta one x by itself. And why this is useful is because we're used to seeing this by itself when we talk about simple and multiple linear regression. We're used to seeing this part by itself. It looks a lot like simple linear regression. And before we had the expected value of y here, or we define mu as the expected value. Here we're de describing mu as a probability of success. So the logit of the probability of success equals something that looks very familiar, what we've seen before. But when we take the r output, r gives us these betas here, 
and we need to figure out what mu is. So we're going to have to use this function a lot. So it's useful to think in terms of the top function because we've seen this already in simple linear regression and it looks familiar. But then R is going to give us output that we need to convert using this function. So we need to know both of them. So that's why these are equivalent, these two statements here and here are equivalent. We just need to know how to go back and forth between them. All right, so how do we interpret these betas now? And then we spend a good amount of time in lab discussing this as well. Next page, please. There we go. So recall from linear regression back to um, week, week one and two. In terms of beta zero, we said the interpretation of this beta zero is the expected value of y, which is also called mu i, equals 4.91224 when x equals zero. And the interpretation of beta one was for linear regression, for each unit change in our X here, the expected value of Y or mu I decreases because it's negative by 0 0.07391. Now, how do we interpret these parameters in Bernoulli regression? It's almost identical, except the definition of mu i changes. In Bernoulli regression, we say the log odds of y i equals 4.91224 when x equals 0. In terms of beta 1, we say for each unit change in x, the log odds of y i decreases by 0 0.07391. So instead of expected value, we say the log odds of yi. Okay, so now let's look at, um, first let's interpret our values for uh, wing length, and then we'll look at how we do this for males and females. So let's go back to our studio and look at our results. So here we have our, our beta zero and our beta one. So to interpret these in terms of survival of mallards, we would say the log odds of survival equals 4.91224 when wing length equals zero. As wing length increases by one unit, by one centimeter, the log odds of survival decreases by 0 0.07391. Now this doesn't make a lot of sense, as you'll see, we'll talk about this in lab quite a bit too, but this doesn't make a lot of sense to us intuitively at this point, because we don't really know what, we don't have any basis for comparison of what log odds are. So we're going to have to convert this to more meaningful units. All right, let's extend this now. Our main question dealt with um, whether or not males or females had different uh, survival rates during breeding season.
So I'm going to actually, instead of just looking at these, this few data points, Well, actually for lecture, I'll just keep this. I'll just generate some data here. All right, so we're gonna say the first three are females and the last three are males. So now we have two covariates. Our first one looked at wing length and survival. Our second one is gonna look at uh, sex and survival. And you could see what the next logical steps after we talk about interpretation are. We have two models. We have maybe even more models if we consider it a null model. Let's do some model selection and choose which one to make inference on. But before we get there, let's talk about model two. So X2 again is male or female. Oh, there we go. All right. So now model two is includes our response variable, whether they survived or not, and what sex they were. So we're moving, we're not considering wing length right now, we're considering sex. So this goes back to our main hypothesis. In terms of interpretation, under this model, it says when X equals zero, the log odds of survival equals 0 0.6931. So when x equals zero, that's our males. So we the log odds of survival for males is 0 0.6931. As x increases by one unit, as x goes from female to ma from male to female, the log odds of survival decreases by 1.3863. Still in terms of log odds, so this doesn't isn't really on a meaningful scale to us yet. And we're going to talk about getting to that meaningful scale now. Would you mind repeating that one more time? What the x two intercept or what the x two estimate means? Yeah. So the x two here is males and females, our covariate. This is our beta one value, our beta one value. So as x increases by one unit. In other words, for our specific example, as we go from males to females, the log odds of survival decreases by 1.3863. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we have some slightly different values in here uh, compared to what I just did in R because I just made up those numbers as one example. But suppose our beta zero and our beta one equal these values. Uh, X1 indicates females, X0 indicates males. We have the exact same uh, model statement here. Um, slightly different parameter values, but that doesn't matter in this case. This just provides an additional example. We have our estimate of beta zero and we have our estimate of beta one. Now the question is, how do we go from log odds of survival, which means very little to us, to survival probability, which we have a better feel for estimating? So we know survival probability should be between zero and one, one meaning it survived completely uh, with no probability of death and zero meaning it died completely with no probability of survival. Well, that's how we, to get to mu by itself, that's what mu is, it's our survival probability in this case. To get mu by itself, we have to do the inverse of this logit function to both sides of this equation. So we're gonna take the inverse of the left-hand side of this equation and the inverse of this right-hand side of this equation. And the inverse of the logit function, I'll write this out.
if we say mu equals x, well, let's just start off with a very simple equation, y equals x. The logit of y equals x. If we want to um, get the logit on the other side, we take the inverse of both functions, uh, the inverse of both sides of the equation. So this is what we did already. And we have just y by itself over here, and we have the logit inverse of x. So we haven't talked about what this logit inverse function looks like yet. So let's take this x and we'll write out what this logit inverse function is. I'll write it out up here first. The logit inverse of any value x equals the exponent of x divided by 1 plus the exponent of x. This is a very important function. You'll need to know how to do this. Because this is the function we're going to use to convert the values that R gives us to meaningful results that are, that are meaningful to in our minds of the biology of the system. R won't do that for us. We have to know how to do that. All right, so that was a simple equation. Now let's look at the equation we're actually using. So we have the logit of mu equals beta zero plus beta one x. We know what betas are from R. And if we're interested in female survival, we know x equals 1. If we're interested in male survival, we know x equals 0. So to get our values of mu, we say the exponent of beta 0 plus beta 1x divided by 1 plus the exponent of beta 0 plus beta 1 x. So to calculate our survival probability for, let's do males first, we plug in our values of beta 0 from r in this function, and we plug in x equals 0. We calculate this whole thing, and that'll give us our survival probability mu. If we're interested in female survival, we say we do the exact same thing except we put in x equals 1 in this function. Here's our x. And here's another x. Is there a way for us to do that in R or do we have to calculate that by hand? You can create a function called logit inverse in R and we do that in lab 4. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So then you can tell it what the betas are and the x's are, and then it'll tell you the probability of survival. All right, so let me return to the lecture notes quickly. That's what this example here goes through. If our beta 0 equals 2.06 and our beta 1 equals negative 0.46, this is the equation we plug in here, and it gives us a survival probability of 0.89. That's what mu equals. Likewise, if we're interested in female breeding survival, the only difference is we add one here instead of zero, and that gives us a survival probability of 0.83. And we see that just from our rough, our, our estimates of the mean, 
that 0.83 is less than uh, 0.89. So that supports our hypothesis. The next thing we would do is look at uncertainty in our beta estimates to see how much support for our hypothesis is there. Okay, so that's the last slide. And I have office hours now, and I'm happy to stick around for uh, to, to discuss this during that time. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question about labs. Yeah, go ahead. So from here on out, you're videoing uh, and then uploading the video, correct? That's right. On our own? Yeah. And then lab sections will be getting with our partners and going through the lab and then asking questions. Is that how it's going to work? Yeah, I'll be I'll still be there for the entire lab session, um, except all the instructional material will be recorded and available beforehand. Yeah, so in in, in many ways, it provides an opportunity to see the, the material beforehand and then ask questions about it and work on it in a more detailed way during lab. Um, and I'm still I'll still be there during lab and, and able to answer questions. And uh, it just provides a little more opportunity to work in pairs in groups on the lab in that specified time. Um, so that's starting this lab, right? Starting this lab is today's the first recorded version. Yep. Okay. And quick question about lab three. It's more of the yeah. paper. What does PPA stand for? That is something like patches per area. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Thanks, you too.